Representative Blanksma, I appreciate you coming. Thanks for having me. We're a month out from the legislative session. Looking back, you've had some time to reflect. What are you uh, most proud of for accomplishments coming out? Oh, I think the tax cut. It was a major tax cut for Idahoans. I think that was really important. I think that was a great way to return the surplus to the people who had provided the surplus. So I I'm really pleased we had that opportunity. Can and you to get it straight out the gate instead of waiting until the end of session to, to nickel and dime and, and pick. So I'm excited about that. For listeners who might not know, can you walk me through a little bit of um, who that tax cut might help? And well, it, it'll help all Idahoans. There is a rebate component, and then there was a decrease in their income tax. So the, everyone should benefit from that tax cut. Okay. Um, looking back, is there anything that you wish the legislator would have pursued more aggressively this year? I think that we had some options when it came to property tax relief that we didn't quite follow through on. There was another um, option, again, returning surplus to the taxpayer. Uh, there was a bill that got caught up again in the end of session, as things tend to do, that would have essentially swept any surplus to provide some property tax relief for homeowners. And so I think I'm a little disappointed that that didn't move forward. I think there's probably an opportunity maybe next year to look at that. But I, I do think we need to start looking at some of those options if we do continue to have these kind of surpluses. Um, shifting a little bit, you mentioned property taxes. Housing is a complex issue. Uh, this year, you helped usher in a uh, workforce housing bill that addressed $50 million. Mm -hmm. um, but housing is a complex issue, and are there anything? Is there anything that you think the leg legislature can do in the short term or the long term to address um, housing shortages or the lack of affordable housing? Well, and I think it's important. Um, there are some uh, there's some misinformation out there about that workforce housing bill. So it's not government housing. Some people are billing that as a government housing bill. That's not at all what it is. What it does is to provide that gap between what um, developers can get privately funded and financed um, versus what they need to actually complete the project. And so it's just a gap component. So it's not government housing. So it just is encouraging development. And it's encouraging development not just for low, but for also middle income earners here in the state of Idaho. So that was the purpose of that funding. And it's done with federal funds. So it, it's it's not an ongoing program. It's, it's a short term solution to what we're experiencing right now. There is a portion of that fund that's dedicated to rural areas, right? Correct. It gives rural priority. Can you talk to me about that? Well, I think there was some concern uh, due to the growth in the Treasure Valley, and I think sometimes the closer you are to the Treasure Valley, the, the more blind that you get to the rest of the state. And so there's always a concern that those funds aren't going to be distributed equally throughout the state, and that was the reason for that, that rural component, is to make sure that even in other areas where they're experiencing growth, maybe not on the same scale as the Treasure Valley, but there there's an opportunity to to, to use that gap funding where appropriate. In coming years, is there um, something the legislature could do or is it's, it's a difficult situation, and, and as we all know, the economy is starting to slow down. Yeah. Uh, we're facing a potential recession, which I think is making everyone nervous. And so I think we really have to see what the revenues are for, for this year and where we sit as far as housing prices going forward. But I, I do understand that here in the Treasure Valley in particular, housing prices are amazingly high, just unspeakably high, and there has to be some solution. Looking back at the session, there were some spirited debates this year on the House floor. Um, as Majority Caucus Chair, what do you, I guess what kind of a role do you think that played in legislation that did and didn't move forward? I think that a lot of what people don't recognize that a lot of the work is done in the committees. Right? Mm -hmm. So we try to vet everything through the committee process. That's oftentimes where we find errors in the legislation, problems with it, or improvements. And so that's why all of it comes through the committee for the most part. And, that, and we try to do that so that oftentimes it looks like there isn't a lot of debate on the floor just because of that process, because a lot of it is vetted through committee. Uh, I think spirited debate is wonderful. I think that it's entertaining, of course, to watch. I think there were times that some people stepped over the line and got a little personal, and you hate to see that, because it should be about policy setting, not personalities, when it comes to that kind of debate. Last year, or this year, did uh, bring out quite, it made the divide between the House Republican Caucus uh, much more clear. Um, are those worse than years past? Um, 
I think there will always be um, subsets within the caucus. We have a caucus of 58 members, so that's 58 out of 70 in the House, meaning our caucus, when we stick together, can run the floor. That's it's that type of supermajority, and very few houses throughout the United States have that kind of supermajority. In fact, Hawaii, I believe, is the only one that enjoys a hundred percent supermajority. So, um, the, and the, of the Democrat Party, of course. But um, it does create um, some conflicts because that is a lot of people to get rowing in the same direction. And so, when you have a lot of strong personalities and a lot of strong beliefs, and you've got people from all over the state, they're they're looking for different things for their districts, and, and that creates conflict. And so we do our best to try to work together. Sometimes we're better at it than others. Did the upcoming primary play a role in that? I think I would not be telling the truth if I <laughs> made any comments about people not looking at, at potential elections. And so I think uh, that's a inherent in the system. If you're up for a re-election every two years, then obviously that's going to have some impact on how you comport yourself uh, for good or for ill. So I believe there, there, I think on the part of some folks, there, there was that need to get certain information out. Speaking of the primary, we know House Majority Leadership will have a big uh, changeover in the 2023 session, what role will that play? Yeah, Any I. Bets on speaker. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he bets on speaker. Yeah, I'm going to step away from that one. That's going to be um, the will of the caucus. As you know, we're looking at a huge turnover. I mean, there's a massive turnover. We had a lot of people retiring. Of course, the speaker um, left to go run for lieutenant governor, and so the, the speakership who attains that will be interesting because that'll set a tone as as well as the other positions in majority leadership on, on the function of the House floor. So I, we're all watching the primary. Um, we've seen uh, numbers anywhere from in the 20s to the 30s on what the turnover can look like and with a House of 70 members, that makes a huge difference. So I, I'm sure that majority leadership will reflect the will of the caucus and we just need to see what that caucus looks like. Representative Blanksman, I appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Thank you.